Hey guys, welcome to this video. My name is John Watts. I'm a consumer protection lawyer and this will be our last video of 2020. And I thought this would be a good case decision to go over to end 2020, even though it's almost a decade old now. The significance of this case, this is the McCulloch case versus JRL, which is a collection law firm, is you really get to see kind of behind the scenes of what happens when a debt buyer then hires a collection law firm to go sue somebody and they sue after the statute of limitation and the consumer says, hey, you've sued me after the statute of limitation. And then eventually the law firm says, oops, okay, we'll dismiss it with prejudice. And then the consumer sues. And it's a very nice verdict that the consumer received here. So let's take a look at this. If you want to read it, I'll put the description in the YouTube video or you can always just type in this case site. So this is known as 637F3rd, and that just stands for the appellate federal decision. And you had the original, then F2nd, and now it's F3rd. And then it's page 939 and 2011. So uh, kind of an interesting note. She did not write the opinion, but actually a Supreme Court justice, Justice O'Connor, was on this panel of three judges. So it doesn't make it any more special, but it does tell us that you had a Supreme Court justice that agrees with this opinion. So it does have some significance. So we've got this debt collection law firm, JRL or the law firm, and they're upset because the consumer sued them and the federal judge entered summary judgment saying, hey, collection law firm, you violated the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And then there's a jury uh, verdict on damages under the FDCPA, and it was over $300,000 in damages. And there was also some state law claims, particularly malicious prosecution, when you bring a lawsuit with no basis. And the Ninth Circuit says, hey, we affirm, we, we agree with what happened at trial. So this particular consumer, uh, he had a, a head injury and uh, he ends up making his last payment in about 1999. And we have this company called Collect America and then CACV of Colorado. And this is a pretty typical setup. We, we don't really see these companies anymore, although I had something with CACV uh, maybe a year ago. But you have one debt buyer that says, hey, we bought the debt. And then they have sort of a sister company that does the collection. And so we see this with LVNV. LVNV doesn't have employees, but they have a company called Resurgent that's kind of a sister company. And we used to see this with Midland Funding would file the suit, but Midland Credit Management always did the collection. And now we see Midland Credit Management actually buys its own debts as well as sort of serves as the servicer for Midland Funding. But anyway, we have here in 2001, the debt buyer buys the debt. And then 2005, they sue the consumer. And he says, hey, statute of limitations is up. And they dismiss the case. Presumably, they dismiss it without prejudice which would allow them to then file suit again. And so all this information is documented in the complaint. So then Collect America in 2006, the next year, retains this law firm. And here we have some stats. In Montana, this law firm filed 2,700 lawsuits. And you think about the population of Montana, that's a tremendous amount of lawsuits. And they typically file five a day. One day they file 40. And about 90% of the collection lawsuits resulted in a default judgment. Default judgments where you don't answer, and so they automatically win. It's like not showing up to the Super Bowl. Guess what? You lose by default. Now, there's an interesting thing. The contract between JRL and this Collect America says, Collect America makes no warranty as to the accuracy or validity of data provided. And hey, you, the collection law firm, have to determine legal and ethical ability to collect these accounts. Now, this is similar to what we've talked about in some of our recent videos about the purchase agreement. 
between the original creditor and the debt buyer. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes that agreement will say something similar about we make no warranty as to the accuracy of, or validity of data provided. Well, now you have the debt buyer, ironically, saying this to the collection law firm. So they're kind of pushing it on the collection law firm. So the law firm, as most of these firms have, they have some type of screening procedure and it says, wait a minute, there may be a problem. So we have this law firm account manager writes to CACV, the debt buyer. It appears statute of limitations has expired as of August 21st, 2005. If you can provide us with an instrument in writing to extend the statute of limitation. So the concept there is in a lot of places to extend the statute of limitation, you need more than just a payment. You need a written document by the consumer. That's true in Alabama, not true everywhere, but true in a lot of places. And then they say, this is part of a batch we're having problems with. So a couple weeks later, CACV responds and says, hey, this guy made a $75 payment in 2004. Do you need more info? And so the argument would be, well, then that would revive the statute of limitation or extend the statute of limitation, give another five years. And the court says, but that information's wrong. He did not make a partial payment. Instead, what happened is the, the debt buyer got some of its court costs back when it dismissed that lawsuit. Uh, or actually, it may have been even for a, um, a different lawsuit. I'm not sure because something worded a little bit later might be an unrelated case. But regardless, CACV got some money back from the court and that got put in as, hey, the consumer made that payment, which is untrue. Now, we see this a lot where maybe there's a repossession and then uh, the, the vehicle is sold and there's a deficiency and they will put in that the, the amount paid at the repossession is a payment from the consumer. Or when the original creditor sells it to a debt buyer, they'll count what the debt buyer paid as a payment by the consumer. Totally untrue. And so we can see here how kind of these companies operate. So uh, the law firm doesn't take the debt buyer up on the request for more information. And they file a lawsuit 2007, this lawyer named Charles Dindy, and they're asking for a bunch of money. And uh, here we have Dindy admit he made no inquiry into whether a partial payment occurred. I just relied on the information provided by the client. So then the consumer files an answer. He says, forgive my spelling. I have a head injury. And you can tell this guy's really suffering. And he says, look, statute of limitations is up. When will it stop? He says, this is the third time. Now, maybe that's right. I, I definitely know it was the second time. But he says, when will it stop? Do I have to sue them so I can live quietly in pain? Because he's got the serious head injury. And if you've ever known anybody that has particularly a closed, uh, closed uh, head injury, you know, it can affect their personality, their mood, and it just really can make life miserable. And you get the sense that's what this guy's going through. And so then he even calls that lawyer and says, hey, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to get summary judgment on statute of limitation." And so then Dindy noted, that's the collection lawyer. We need to get what the client has for docs. And then the Collect America, remember, that's kind of the collection arm for the debt buyer, CACV, says because of the age account, we can't get you anything else. Like, this is all you got. So what does the collection lawyer do? Continues to prosecute the suit. Very, very typical. And then in August, the debt buyer informs the collection law firm, Oops, <laughs> that wasn't a payment. That was actually unused cost by another office, not a payment. And so that's put into the file. But then the collection lawyer says, well, I didn't look at the file and see it. So he continues to prosecute the case. This is very interesting. He serves these requests for admissions. And, and this is the Ninth Circuit. It's one of our appellate courts has taken the time to look at this and say, well, what did you try to get the consumer to admit to in that, we'll just call it a small claims case, in that small claims collection case? So look at this. I, I, I don't have it highlighted, but question 11 is, you never notified the plaintiff or any other party about a dispute. 
Well, he filed an answer back on the first lawsuit saying, I dispute this because statute of limitations has expired. Look at this number 14. No facts that you rely on as a basis for a defense. Well, they know that that's not true because he's told them statute of limitations. And they know, the collection law firm knows, statute of limitations has expired. 17. Every statement or allegation is true and correct. Well, they know it's untrue. Number 21. You made a payment. In June 2004, at 75, they know that that's untrue. And it did not have an explanation that under the rules of civil procedure, you have to respond in 30 days or they're admitted. And so this consumer hires a lawyer. They deny all those requests. And then this is kind of interesting here. We have, uh, and I'm not sure why this didn't get highlighted, but here's an email uh, from this collection lawyer to the debt buyer marked urgent. And it says, let me just highlight this. It says, an attorney has appeared and he served discovery requests. The attorney is one who is anti-purchase debt. I like that. I never thought of that expression before, but that, that would describe me. I am anti-purchase debt. Or maybe I should clarify and say I'm anti-purchase debt when they file bogus lawsuits and are unwilling or unable to prove their case. So he says, well, this lawyer is going to try to run up costs. And so I need everything you have. The response is, we don't have anything else. This is all, all you have is all we have. And <clears throat> then they also explain that last payment, uh, proceeded the charge off. And then the debt buyer said, you need to dismiss this case. We're instructing you dismiss this case ASAP because of statute of limitation problem, SOL, statute of limitation. So he does that. And then the consumer sues him, it can, uh, sues the collection law firm. And so the district court judge, which is the trial judge in federal court, said these three facts are established. Number one, you filed a time-barred lawsuit. In other words, the, the time to file it was over, and you still filed it. And then that was April. By August, you knew that it was uh, time-barred. And then number three, you continue to prosecute it until December. So what, August to December? You know, what's that, five months and four months? And so the, the district court granted the consumer partial summary judgment. And then it goes to a jury trial. And there are some lawyers that testify. These are consumer lawyers. And they say, look, vast majority of lawsuits result in default judgments. And this collection law firm takes a factory approach. They're just mass producing default judgment. So it's not that they made a mistake. It's just their whole system is set up where it's just this factory of cranking out these lawsuits without any really uh, evaluation of them. And so look at what the jury did. $1,000 statutory. That's the most they can award. $250,000 for emotional stress. That's fantastic. 60,000 in punitive damages. That's great. Punitive damages are to punish this collection law firm so they don't do this again and to deter this collection law firm and other collection law firms from doing something similar. So the collection law firm, of course, has a complete meltdown here and they're appealing and challenging everything. And now the Ninth Circuit's going to go through pretty exhaustive analysis here to say everything that happened in the district court, that was done correctly. So what's the purpose of the FDCPA? Eliminate abusive debt collection practices. Ensure the collectors who abstain from violating the law are not competitively disadvantaged. In other words, if you have one collector that says, you know what, the law says that you get 30 days to uh, request validation. We're only going to give consumers 15 days. Well, that would put the guys that followed the law at a competitive disadvantage. So we don't want that. So the FDCPA is to protect consumers and the honorable law-abiding collection uh, firms and even collection law firms. And it's to promote consistent state action, protect consumers. So it's a strict liability, which means if you break the law, you're guilty. So it's a little different than negligence like we would have in a car wreck. Except there is something called a bona fide error defense. And that says that the collector can show by preponderance of the evidence, which just means more likely than not, they have to prove this. They bear the burden of proof 
that the violation was not intentional and resulted from a bona fide error, notwithstanding having these procedures reasonably adapted to avoid such errors. So what it's saying is you've got to have certain factors in place to meet this defense. So sometimes these are broken down a little bit differently, but this court breaks it down into three factors. You violated the law unintentionally. So look, if you do an intentional violation, boom, you lose bona fide error defense. Even if it's unintentional, you have to then show number two, the violation resulted from a bona fide error. So it's got to be a legitimate error. So we're talking about just a mistake, not, hey, I was super careless here. And then, or even not, not even super careless, just careless. And then number three, you maintain procedures reasonably adapted to avoid the violation. So you can't just say, uh, we have a policy, don't violate the law. There you go. No, no, no. It's got to be very specific. So if you're filing a lawsuit, you better have specific procedures to make sure statute of limitations is not expired. If you're calling somebody after the time period you're allowed to call them at night, or you're calling them too early in the morning, you better have procedures designed specifically for that. If you're calling third parties, so ex-girlfriend, ex-wife, boss, brother, whoever, and you have no right to call them, well, you better have specific procedures for that. So again, it can't just be this generic, well, we do not violate the law. Make sure you don't violate the law. No, that doesn't do any good. All right, so now the district court said this bona fide error defense fails as a matter of law, which means the district court judge did not even let the jury consider this. The judge just said, you lose. There's no way a reasonable jury could rule in your favor. So the law firm says, well, we have these adequate procedures. And the court says, but they have to be reasonably adapted to avoid the specific error. So what did what did this law firm do? They said, well, we're just relying without verification on the representation. And we're going to overlook the contrary information. And so they say, that's not good enough. And then this idea of relying on the representation, the partial payment, they say bona fide error does not protect a debt collector whose reliance is unreasonable. And the, the, start going through some case law here in this Riker case. So the fact that the creditor provided accurate information in the past is not good enough. Okay, And then they say, well, look, it's just unreasonable because the contract expressly disclaimed the accuracy or validity of the data. So how can you say, well, I know the contract tells us don't rely on it, but we're relying on the debt buyer. It's the same thing that we talk about with the purchase agreement. When the original creditor says, hey, we don't make any representations to the accuracy of the information, and the debt buyer says, well, hey, obviously it must be 100% true. Well, no, you can't have that contradiction there. And then the court points out, and you had the information in your file that told you this wasn't a partial payment, and this guy had asserted a statute of limitation in the previous case, and in this case, and he even called you and told you that. And so they say, relying on the client is just unreasonable. All right, so what about this idea of a, uh, let me get this highlight here, violation of the FDCPA by requesting attorney's fees when there was no right to do that? Well, not even this collection firm disputes that pursuing unauthorized attorney's fees violates 1692F, which says don't do things that are unfair, and 1692E, which says don't misrepresent anything. And so the court just says, you know, that's a problem. And so here's the argument from the law firm. They say, let me get this highlighted here. They say that, uh, well, what we're really complaining about here is uh, we didn't have proof at the time we filed the suit. And the court says, no, no. The reason you're in trouble is you didn't have entitlement to collect the fees when it came time to sort of put up or shut up, which is at summary judgment stage. So we're not talking about, did you have the proof, the evidence at the time you filed the suit, but how about when it came time to prove your case? You didn't have that. And then they say, well, we think a jury should have I've looked at this and I want you to really pay attention to this because we're going to kind of 
take what the judge says, the, the judges say here in a little different way. But, you know, we've talked about, you know, with a credit card, there is a contract between you and the credit card company. And now it may be verbal, okay, in the sense of how you applied for it, but there will be something called the credit card agreement. That's different than the purchase agreement. Credit card agreements between you and the credit card company. And so the law firm says, well, we presented the credit card agreement that uh, shows we can get attorney's fees. And then they say, now, of course, we admit that actually wasn't the one with the consumer, okay? But then they say, but here's our solution. All the credit card agreements permit fees, so therefore we're good, right? And see, this is what they'll do in a collection case against you because they got to prove the interest, right? I mean, how do we know the interest was 29%? They, well, they go, well, it's on a statement. Well, I don't care if it's on a statement. That doesn't mean it's right. If my terms and agreement, my credit card agreement say it's 19% interest and my statement says 59% interest, guess what? The statement's wrong. They're violating the contract. So let's look and see what the court says. The, the law firm says, well, the fact that we failed to produce a credit card or card member agreement applicable to consumer was not fatal. And the court said, no, listen to me. You failed to meet your burden to show a genuine issue for trial because you presented no admissible evidence of a contract authorizing fee. Here's what the FDCPA says. Remember, this is that uh, section F. And specifically, let me just get this a different color. Uh, it's subpart one. So it says the collection of any amount, unless such amount is expressly authorized by the, the agreement creating the debt. Well, they didn't produce evidence of an express authorization uh, from the consumer. And this generic evidence that all credit cards contain attorney's fees, that's not sufficient to go to a jury. That is really, really critical because when you're sued for breach of contract or open account or whatever they want to say, and they cannot prove the card member agreement, the terms and conditions called different things. Let's just call it the credit card agreement. When they can't prove what that agreement was, then that's a problem. So I'll give you an example. So let's say we have a case where we took out the credit card in 2016. We stopped paying in 2018. And so they come to trial and they say, here's the card, uh, credit card agreement. And we look at the bottom of it. It says, you know, revised January 2020. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> How could this be the agreement that I took out in 2016? They go, oh, well, judge, I mean, it, it's it's basically the same. Don't worry about that. Well, they got to have the agreement, okay? Now, I'm not saying they have to have, like, the literal piece of paper that they mailed you, but it better be identical to that, okay? And they have to show this is when it went into effect. These are the amendments Here's how we got these to the consumer. Did they mail them to you? Well, they have to be received by the consumer. So now the consumer, if that's you testifying, if it's your client, if you're a lawyer, you know, does your client testify, hey, I didn't get that. Well, that's a problem if they can't prove that it was actually sent and received. All right, so let's go on. Let's look at these requests for admission. This is an interesting thing that I'm, I'm not sure every court would agree with this, but they make a very strong argument in here. And so I think it's it's very compelling. So the law firm says, well, the FDCPA should not be read to cover discovery procedures such as requests for admission. This little footnote here says, well, hey guys, one problem with that is at the bottom of your request for admissions, it said, this is an attempt to collect a debt. So you're, you're kind of admitting you are trying to collect a debt, which is what the FDCPA regulates. And... So the law firm says, well, we admit that the filing of complaints, that's the Donahue case, and service of settlement letters, Heinz, that that covers, that that's covered by the FDCPA. And, but then they'd say, but discovery shouldn't. And the court says, no, we don't agree with that. It's litigating activities of lawyers. That's what's covered here in litigation. And 
They talk about uh, purely legal activities, okay? And that's covered like uh, application for a writ of garnishment. That would be covered here. And they say there's no principal distinction to be drawn between these types of litigation activities and written discovery. <coughs> Excuse me. And so they go, look, our sister circuits agree. The Fourth Circuit says written discovery, interrogatories, that's where they're in, sort of interrogating you in writing. In summary judgment motion, that would all apply. And the, the law firm, this is a common argument. They say, well, look, if we misbehaved in the small claims court, we should be punished in the small claims court. The state court judge can regulate us so if this federal law doesn't have anything to do with this. And they go, no, the FDCPA expressly says because prior laws for redressing abusive, deceptive, unfair debt collection were inadequate. And so those state law rules that are less than the FDCPA are done away with. And then they say, look, policy reasoning provides no authority. We apply the statute as Congress wrote it, and it's pretty clear what it covers. And so then they say the district court held that the service of false requests for admissions violated the FDCPA. And the FDCPA protects the consumers, the gullible, as well as the shrewd, the ignorant, the unthinking, and the credulous. Now, there's a little different standard in some places, but it's all the idea that we don't say, well, Mr. or Miss Consumer, you have to be the most sophisticated person and you should have realized they were lying to you. That's not how we look at it. And then let's look here at this thing because this paragraph really sort of sets it out. They asked the consumer to admit facts that were just not true. So one example, he had never disputed the debt. Well, he had. Hey, you have no defenses. He had a perfect defense, statute of limitations. Every statement in the complaint was true. That's not true. And that he actually made a payment in June 2004. And they say, look, collection law firm, you had information that demonstrated the untruthfulness of those admissions. So you violated the FDCPA by sending those requests for admission. That is powerful, very, very powerful, because these guys will get so aggressive in their requests for admissions because the, the basic idea is nobody's going to respond to them. And, and I'll tell you what, if, if you'll help me remember, maybe put a comment I'll take some sample requests for admissions that that I have from some different law firms, collection law firms, and we'll just go through them on the screen and say, okay, how would we answer these? And so I want you to see kind of how over the top these things are. And then uh, the court blasts this law firm for not telling this consumer, if you don't ad do something within 30 days, you admit these. And And look down here effectively requested that he admit the entire case against him and concede all defenses. And that just really seemed to tick off the court here. And then we'll come down to uh, some evidence. We won't go into a whole lot of this, but just was it proper to allow other consumers who had been sued to talk about their experience? And they say yes. And part of that is to get the maximum amount of the statutory damages, which is $1,000, we have to show that these violations were intentional, or at least that can help us. And malicious prosecution, abuse of process require proof of malice, willfulness, uh, punitive damages, reprehensibility. And remember, the law firm is saying, well, this is just a mistake, an innocent mistake. So it helps to say, no, you keep making these same errors over and over. And then they got some consumer lawyers and the basic gist is the law firm didn't know how to properly object at trial. And so they waived that and some other stuff that is similar to that. So malicious prosecution, uh, and this will vary by state, but basically judicial proceeding, number two, uh, the defendant was responsible. Number three, there's lack of probable cause. Number four, there was malice. Number five, the consumer won, and then number six, the consumer suffered damage. This is what the battle always is, is over lack of probable cause and malice. And so probable cause is when you reasonably believe that you have a claim, okay? And 
the the court says this law firm cannot say that because they knew that it was time barred and they just sort of closed their eyes to the truth. And then once they found out the truth, they continued to prosecute it for four months after being told this is this was a bad lawsuit. You need to get rid of it. And then we have this element of malice. And they say under Montana law, it's a little confusing, but either way, it's malice. And this is true in most states, certainly true in Alabama. A rebuttable presumption of malice arose when the jury found an absence of probable cause. So there's a relationship between probable cause and malice. And there's also something called abuse of process, which is basically you just file a lawsuit for a bad purpose. And they say they filed this case to extract money that they had no legal right to. And they, they were using that lawsuit to basically steal this guy's money. And then the damages, there's an argument about the 250000 for emotional distress. And the court says, we generally defer to the jury's findings on that. And FDCPA allows actual damages, which includes emotional distress. And you can see here is a, a jury charge, what the jury was actually told. The law does not set a definite standard to calculate compensation, uh, nor is there any requirement an expert witness and uh, the law firm says, well, basically, he just said he, he got mad. And so that's not enough. And the court says, no, you're just wrong in that. <laughs> he describes all sorts of things. You know, down here, uh, downtime, severe headaches, uh, caused him anxiety, increased his temper, pain, adrenaline, conflict with his wife. And he had an underlying condition. But look, this is true whether we're talking about a car wreck or this type of situation, you can have an underlying condition. So you might say, well, I have a bad back. And then boom, you get hit from behind and that makes it worse. So sometimes that's called aggravating a pre-existing injury. He put it in just very good terms here, straw that broke the camel's back. He thought the lawsuit was frivolous, an insult. He's being shoved around. And so the, the court says, hey, we're keeping that. And the, the final argument is they say, well, that 250000 is really to punish us. And, and the court says, no, they punished you by giving you punitive or awarding punitive damages against you. This is something extra. This is to compensate the consumer. So and then there's some footnotes down here. And, uh, you know, it, it's definitely an opinion worth reading. If you think you've been sued after the statute of limitation, if you've won your case, and maybe you're thinking about suing the collection law firm or more commonly just the debt buyer. Now, this case has some really good language, but also has language that's helpful. You know, when somebody, in this case, a collection law firm is saying, well, we rely on our client, but the contract says don't rely. Well, that's no good. It's the same thing if the debt buyer says, well, we're relying on the original creditor, but the purchase agreement says we don't make any promises about this. And also you see how requests for admissions, when they step over the line and they put stuff in the request for admissions that they know is not true, that's a big problem for these collection law firms and these debt buyers. So hope you found this helpful. Hey guys, I really appreciate you know everybody that's watched videos, that's commented, shared, liked, even if you dislike the video. I mean, I want the feedback of what you think because, uh, you know, we do these videos to share a lot of information. And obviously, we get clients from this, okay? So I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I mean, I get a lot of clients from the videos. But the main purpose is to put this information out there. Because most of you that are watching this are not in Alabama where I practice. And so if you've been sued by a debt collector, you need a lawyer in your state. Now, if you think you have a claim where you can sue a debt collector or a credit bureau or a creditor and we can certainly talk about that and and that could be brought for example typically in Alabama or we could co-counsel with a lawyer in your state uh, so I'm always happy to to talk but whether we get any business out of this or not my real goal is to put this information out there for you so that not that you rely on this because I don't know your individual situation but just to give you kind of a starting point, some questions to ask or to read through this case and go, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if that's true 
where I live. Well, now you know questions to ask. It's sort of like if you go to a doctor and and the doctor might be very helpful, but if you don't know the questions to ask, well, you're not going to get any answers. So this is to, to really learn some questions to ask, learn some ideas. And, and if you've got a lawyer, talk to your lawyer about it. Say, hey, you know, there's this opinion from the Ninth Circuit. Does this apply to us? Does this help us? And the lawyer may say, nope, we're in a different place, totally different rule, or yeah, that's really good. So, I mean, I can tell you that We've been suing debt buyers, suing credit bureaus, debt collectors, mortgage companies for many, many, many years. And and look, I always like when a client says, hey, I found this case. Can this help us? Well, typically we know what the law is, but we can't read every case. And so there are times where I've had a client bring me something. I go, wow, that's really interesting. You know, I had not thought about it in that way. Let's kind of kick this around a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we're going to do that in your case. And so I appreciate when my clients bring me cases or, hey, I saw this idea or this strategy. Hey, you know, there is, should be no ego in this business. We need to be willing to listen to anybody, look at different viewpoints, and then say, okay, what will my judge allow? What will be successful here? So again, thank you everybody for watching videos this year. The last maybe six or seven months, we tried to put out a video every day. I think we have, and I'm you know barely getting this in in time <laughs> on the last day. Uh, and our plan is to continue that in 2021, to put a new video out every day. So uh, let us know what you're interested in, suggestions you have. Feel free to share these videos, uh, subscribe to the channel so you get notified. And what is it, you click the little bell or something so you get, a I guess, an email notification of it. So I uh, just appreciate you guys. Wish you only great success in 2021, and I will see you tomorrow. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye.